the most widely read product liability blog on the internet. Is that like world's tallest midget? <laughs> I realize that I may be damning myself with faint praise when I say that it's the most widely read product liability blog on the internet, but that's my claim to fame, and by God, I'm sticking with it. <laughs> what, what is it? It is the drug and device law blog. It is addressed almost entirely to issues of the defense of pharmaceutical and medical device product liability cases. So it is a niche blog. It is inconceivable that we will ever draw anything like uh, 20,000 unique visitors every weekday. It is also hosted in a very odd way. That is, so far as I am aware, it is the only blog that is hosted by partners at two different large and directly competitive law firms. That is, blogging about pharmaceutical product liability defense. I am a partner at Jones Day, and my co-host is with Deckert. So we are direct head-to-head -head competitors at law firms competing for the same business, sometimes in the very field that we're blogging about, and yet we host it together, which is you know, either genius or stupidity. Perhaps time will tell. Why did I start it? Let me tell you a story. I wrote a book, Amazon, a book, that book. Amazon.com ranks all books in straight numerical sales order, from number one, which today might be, I don't know, Sarah Palin's going rogue, or maybe, I, w I don't want to play political favorites, maybe it's still Barack Obama's audacity of hope, but some recent bestseller is surely number one on the Amazon list today, all the way down literally to number 4.5 million which is you know, some out-of-print Sudanese cookbook that you couldn't buy if you wanted to. But they rank all books from one to 4.5 million. So if you ever write a book, there is plenty of room for public humiliation there. <laughs> my, my book had an Amazon rank of 47,369. 47,369 when the guy who hosts the Wall Street Journal law blog public posted a book review of the book and then posted an excerpt from the book later in the day on the Wall Street Journal law blog. Within 24 hours, the book had gone from 47,369 to 434. And it was at that instant that I realized that I was missing a trick, that there is a huge, potent, force out there in the economy and in the marketplace that I was simply overlooking. And I must say that the book was reviewed in print editions of various publications many, many times, never moved the needle that I could tell. But putting it online on a blog made it jump a truly startling amount. And seeing those results, I decided that I was nuts not to be in the blogosphere. Why did I ask a co-host to do it with me? First, because I knew I needed another psycho, <clears throat> somebody who would continue to read drug and device product liability cases and to crank out short articles about those cases at a relentless pace, even after it was no longer fun, because we would have been doing it for a while and it would be deadly tedious to continue to write on the field. And the person who I had in mind, it had to be somebody who had written a lot in the field so you knew he had spare you know, theses to spare so that he would have things he wanted to write about. There was only one person in the world who I thought it made sense to ask. And in addition to that, for my purposes, unlike I think, like for Eugene's purposes, having two different law firms serves a purpose, which is plausible deniability. If, if we type enough words, and over the course of better than three years of blogging, we have typed an awful lot of words, you are going to say something that you regret. It will be cited against you in court. It will be used against you or one of your colleagues or one of your clients. And if everything is signed by you or others at your law firm, you sort of have to take the blame. But when you're signing everything with two names, you can say, that was his post, <laughs> that wasn't mine. So it gives you an opportunity to weasel out of things that you are going to write and you are going to regret because it is absolutely guaranteed that's going to happen over time. And then finally is this sort of introduction to what I'm doing, I would say that I've, in, in terms of readership, we get something like 40,000 page views a month. There are two things to realize that I said that were different than what Eugene just said. He said 20,000 a day, 
I said month, 40,000 a month. And he said unique visitors a day. And I said page views. So I have built into what I said every cheat known to man, whereas he is actually legitimately telling you the number of unique visitors, because obviously I could have a visitor who could come and look at six pages. I'm counting that as six, and he's counting that as one. In terms of effect, though, even a niche blog with you know, relatively good readership by blog standards, but nothing like the truly influential blogs, has had a real effect and effects that we can, we can tell, we know have happened in the world. And one example I will give is that we publish a post suggesting that the FDA could usefully promulgate a new regulation. We explained the history of it, why the regulation made sense, why it would be legitimate to do it, and why it would help companies in a, var a variety of different ways. We then saw 10 or 11 months later that the FDA had proposed a regulation that did exactly the thing that we had proposed on the blog. And some months after that, attending a seminar, I heard an in-house lawyer at the FDA say, in fact, we got the idea for a regulation from seeing it online at the Drug and Device Law Blog. So we have seen ideas that we have proposed on our blogs actually implemented into law in the country. So we're having an, ef an effect, an effect in our little field, and that's what, part of what makes the experiment so interesting. <laughs>